Hello. In the last video, we talked about instrumental variables, and we also talked about some of the uh, things that it does well, right? It can identify a causal effect, and some of the assumptions that we have to make, right? We have to assume that the variable is relevant, that the instrumental variable actually predicts our treatment variable, and that it is valid, that there's no open back doors uh, between our instrument and our outcome. And I also mentioned that instrumental variables has been getting sort of a, a bad rap recently. Uh, and that it's not used as much as it used to be. And, and there's some good reasons for that. And let's talk about some of those reasons and some of the difficulties that we're going to run into in using instrumental variables in this video. So there are a couple of things that don't work very well about instrumental variables, some of them we already talked about. Uh, so, uh, for example, I talked about the fact that we get a local average treatment effect. Uh, so local average treatment effect, again, is that we are weighting the effects more heavily among people who are definitely affected by the instrument. Uh, now, why is this a bad thing? Well, it generally doesn't map super, super well to the actual effect that we want to get. So why are we interested in getting a causal effect in the first place? Well, we might want to be interested in what's going to happen if we change something about the world. Okay, so we might, for example, want to say, okay, well, what, what's going to happen if I make, I used the example last time of if you go into the military, what's going to happen to your earnings? Okay, well, what are we going to do with that information once we have it? Well, what if we force everybody to go in the military? Well, then we would want to know, well, for the average person, what's going to be the effect on the, of the military on their earnings later? Uh, but that's not what the local average treatment effect gives us. We might also be interested in, okay, well, other people who don't currently go into the military, what would be the effect be for them? Well, that local average treatment effect doesn't give us that either. Uh, or if we just encouraged a few more people to go into the military, what would be the effect for them? Well, that doesn't, we don't get that either. What the local average treatment effect gives us is it gives us the effect among people who can be affected by the instrument, who are strongly affected by the instrument, they go in here. Uh, which, unless you're going to use the instrument to assign people to go into the military, is probably not what you're interested in doing, right? If I want to know, okay, well, I see all these people who currently voluntarily go into the military, what's the effect on their earnings? Well, uh, for that, I might be interested in, well, what's the effect of people who go into the military for voluntary reasons? And if I'm using an instrument based on involuntarily going into the military because of your draft number, well, then I'm not getting the effect that I want. So sometimes the local average treatment effect is just fine. Uh, sometimes it is what you want if you're going to use the draft again to send people into the military. Um, but often it's not what you want the actual effect to be. That's one thing. The other thing we already talked about uh, is that we need a relevance condition. We need the instrument to actually affect our outcome variable. Uh, and this can be a very big problem if it's not true, because the, the, the instrument doesn't just need to affect the, the, the treatment variable. It needs to affect it very strongly. Otherwise, we have what's called a weak instrument problem. Uh, and this can lead us to really bad bias situations. So the instrumental variables estimator basically says, I'm going to take the part of the variation in X that is explained by Z and use that to explain Y. Uh, but if there's almost no variation in X that is explained by Z, there's nothing that we have to work with. And what we end up getting is an extremely noisy estimator, right? If we take a variable that has basically no variation in it and you put it in a regression, well, then the effect that you get is going to vary very wildly from sample to sample. Uh, and so if, in order for this to work, you need to have a lot of the variation in X explained by the instrument. Uh, now, there are some rules of thumb that people tend to use to check if their instruments are weak or not. For example, you might do a, 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 a joint uh, robustness test of all the instrument, or you might do a joint hypothesis test of all the instruments in the first stage. And if it's above 10, then you're like, oh, yeah, there's no weak instrument problem. I don't love these rules of thumb uh, because... Uh, if you apply them, uh, then it actually introduces some bias itself into your estimates because you are selecting. And you generally don't want to select what your analysis should be on the basis of a significance test. That's generally a bad idea. It biases your results. Uh, you're, you're likely to pick out uh, samples that just so happened to get a sample where the, the, the result was significant as opposed to actually just picking strong results. So there are some ways around weak instruments by just seeing what the relationship is. Uh, it's checking that F statistic is above 10, but it's not great. Uh, but in general, you want to pick instruments that have st strong theoretical reasons to believe why they would explain a lot of the variation in X. So to get around that weak instrument problem. Let's talk about some other problems that instrumental variables runs into as well. Related to the weak instrument problem is the small sample bias problem. Uh, so instrumental variables is actually a biased estimator. Uh, on average, if you get a bunch of samples over and over and over again, you will not quite exactly get the uh, the causal effect. You, you might get closer to it than, uh, than ordinarily squares, but uh, you won't get it exactly. And the reason for that is the small sample bias. So 
Why does this occur? So uh, the, re the reason why our instrumental variables work is because we're assuming that there's no relationship between our instrument and uh, the outcome except through our treatment variable. Now, if this is true, if, we, if this is theoretically true, if we have reason to believe that in the population there's no relationship, still, in a particular sample, uh, there might just happen to be a correlation between our instrument and the, uh, the error term in the second stage, which is what there needs to be for there to be a relationship between Z and the outcome that doesn't go through the treatment. Uh, now, this is what's called small sample bias because in the population it doesn't exist, but in a given sample you can just randomly, by bad luck, get a relationship. Uh, and this relationship is going to bias our estimate because there's going to be some relationship between Z and our error term and definitely a relationship between Z and our X. That is the definition of the emitted variable bias problem. Uh, so the exact amount of the small sample bias is this. Uh, it's going to be to the extent of the correlation between Z and the error term, which again only exists in the small sample, divided by the correlation between Z and X, and then scaled by the standard deviations of the error term and X. Uh, so in a small sample, we get this bias term. So what this tells us is a couple things. So for one, if you're going to do instrumental variables, you want to have a big sample so that the small sample bias is unlikely to occur. Second, notice that we have the correlation between z and x in the denominator. So this small sample bias is eased the stronger the relationship is between z and x. Uh, so that's a good thing, which also is another reason why we, not, we need to avoid those weak instruments. If the instrument is not that strongly related to x, then this whole term is going to get really, really big, and we're going to get really, really swingy estimates. Uh, so you might even get, oh my god, the treatment has an enormous effect on our outcome variable. But that's just because the instrument is not that strongly related to X. And so in a given sample, you might see that, you know, if you have a tiny amount of variation and then you extrapolate that out to an entire effect, it might get to this really big thing, right? Because a tiny amount of variation can really swing around what the line's going to look like. Because there's not a lot for it to fit on, right? If you only have two points, then that could be this line. It could just move a tiny little bit. Now it's this line suddenly. You move it a tiny little bit more. And oh, now it's this line. You get this huge effect, right? There's only a little bit of variation then just a tiny bit of random variation can lead to huge differences in the line that you would draw. Uh, and that's, that, that's one reason why we have uh, this weak instrument problem and why it makes small sample bias worse. The last thing I'm going to talk about is monotonicity. Uh, so this is sort of the forgotten third assumption in instrumental variables next to relevance and validity. Uh, but we need it uh, to, to, uh, to work, for this all to work. So uh, I mentioned before that what instrumental variables isolates is a local average treatment effect, where people who are affected by the instrument more strongly are weighted more heavily in their uh, in their effect, right? So if you have a pie, if you are very strongly affected by the instrument, and if the treatment is really good for you, then it's going to make it look like the treatment is better. Okay, but what if the instrument makes me get more treatment and makes somebody else get less treatment? That would be a violation of what's called monotonicity. Right? So monotonicity is the assumption that the instrument has the same direction effect on everybody, or zero. Right? It's okay if it doesn't affect you at all, uh, but if it affects me positively, if it gives me more treatment and gives this other person less treatment, what's this going to do to that local average treatment effect? It's going to say, okay, you get really strongly affected, uh, you get a lot more treatment because of the instrument, so I'm going to weight you really strongly. But you get less treatment because of the instrument, so I'm getting weighted really strongly, you're getting weighted negatively, that doesn't really make a lot of sense, right? It doesn't really make a lot of sense to weight me, to make you weight you not just zero, but negatively, right? I'm taking your effect out of the local average treatment effect. And so it, it, if, it, if, if the treatment would be really good for both of us, uh, but we get affected by the instrument in opposite directions, it's going to look like the effect is zero, right? Because we're going to cancel each other out because I get a positive weight and you get a negative weight and they cancel each other out. So we need to assume monotonicity, uh, which is that every person uh, in the sample, uh, either is not affected by the instrument at all, or is affected in the same direction. So it's okay if the instrument has a negative effect, as long as it has a negative effect on everybody. Uh, and so that's an assumption that we need to make. So we need to make sure that that is plausible in this case. So in the draft example, uh, is it plausible to imagine, for example, that being drafted very early uh, might make some people more likely to go into the military and also some people less likely to go into the military? Maybe. Uh, you can imagine some stories, right? Certainly, you know, if you see, oh, my, my, my birthday came up first, I'm, gonna, I'm definitely going to get drafted. That might make you more likely to say, go into college so that you can uh, skip the draft. Uh, so you can imagine how there might be a small negative effect for some people there where it's a positive effect for others, in which case we get those negative weights and we don't like that. All right, one last thing, and that is just the difficulty of 
satisfying validity. We've talked about validity before, uh, the assumption that the instrument can only affect the outcome through the treatment, right? It has to be exogenous after we do controls. Uh, and this is just really, really hard to do. Good instrumental variables are super hard to find. Because think about what needs to be the case, right? We need to do the exact same thing we were doing with the treatment. Uh, we need to find a variable that is somehow related to the treatment, but basically unrelated to everything else. How does that possibly occur? And it can occur in some cases, right? So if you actually have randomization in the real world, great, like with the birthday lottery thing, that's an actual randomization that's probably unrelated to pretty much everything else. Um, but anything that's actually in the real world is almost certainly gonna be related to stuff. So it's just really hard to find an instrument and actually convince people that it works. And there have been a lot of examples of instruments that economists used to think were okay, but then as we looked back at them and thought again, well, maybe that's not actually exogenous. Uh, so let's take it, rainfall for an example. There have been a bunch of papers that use rainfall in a given area as an instrument for things like agricultural productivity, right? So you can imagine, you know, different places get different amounts of rainfall. They might be endogenous, but within a given place, the year-to-year -year variation in rainfall, maybe we can call that exogenous. And so people used it as an instrument for things that would affect agricultural productivity, but not affect other things. But there's some problems with that. So one thing is that rainfall also affects lots of other stuff besides agricultural productivity. So even if it is not, there's not a back door, maybe it affects other things, like maybe it makes people more likely to drive rather than walk. Maybe that has some sort of effect on something. Uh, or maybe there's a monotonicity issue. Maybe if you're growing some kinds of crops, it really helps you out uh, with agricultural productivity, but other crops get flooded and it makes you worse at agricultural productivity. Uh, also, uh, yeah, sure, okay, maybe uh, rainfall is exogenous, except that it affects my productivity and also my neighbor's productivity. Uh, and the rainfall that my neighbor gets is correlated with my rainfall, so suddenly there's a path from my rainfall to your rainfall to your productivity, to which might affect other things as well. And also, if people start using rainfall as an instrument for other stuff, so like they use rainfall as an instrument for warfare, right? Because if it's raining, you might be less likely to want to go fight people. Uh, and so if it affects agricultural productivity and also affects warfare, well then suddenly it doesn't work as an instrument for either of them because there's now back doors between the two. Uh, and so an instrument that seemed to work okay suddenly doesn't work so well. Uh, so just finding an instrument that actually works, that we can actually believe is truly exogenous, only happens in a couple of scenarios. So one of those scenarios is that we have actual literal randomization that occurred. So for example, if you're doing an actual experiment, do instrumental variables, works just fine. Uh, another thing is that if you have something that is, that is actually truly outside the system and actually like a mistake or some sort of glitch uh, or some sort of random thing. So for example, I wrote a paper once uh, where uh, there were some job interviews that you that teachers did to try to get a teaching job. Uh, and then their, their, their interview scores got added up to see whether they would progress to the next stage of the interview. But there were arithmetic mistakes in the adding up. That's probably random. And so that is a pretty good instrument. Uh, so it's truly outside of the system, truly just a hiccup in the system is the kind of thing that you want. Uh, and, and in general, if you want to go beyond that, uh, it's, it's really variables that need to be so surprising that they'd be related to the treatment at all, but then you realize that there actually is a good reason why it is, right? So there needs to be, it needs to be so surprising that it's related to the treatment because if it makes sense that it's related to the treatment, it's almost certainly related to other stuff in the system as well that you don't want. So for example, another one of those instruments that used to get used a lot and definitely no longer is, is that people used to instrument your own education level using your parents' education level. It makes a lot of sense why your parents' education level would be related to your education level, but of course, it's gonna be related to everything else in the system that was causing endogeneity problems in the first place. So we can't use that. All right, so those are some of the problems that we have to deal with in instruments. We have to really be careful about those uh, validity conditions. It's hard to find a good instrument. We also need to really care about relevance. Uh, we need to make sure that the instrument actually predicts the treatment variable well, or else we have a weak instrument problem, which can make our small sample bias, which always exists regardless, but it can make it worse. We also need to worry about monotonicity, that every person is affected in the same direction or not at all by the instrument. Uh, and then that's just a lot of difficult things that we need to deal with with instruments. Uh, that said, it's still worth trying to do. If you can find an actual good instrument that has all the right properties and passes all these problems, then hey, you have a good instrument and that's a cool thing. All right, that's it. Thank you.